Welcome to the Better Business, Better Life show. I'm your podcast host, Deborah Chantry-Taylor. In this podcast, I interview business owners, EOS implementers, and business experts who share with you their experiences, tips, and tools to help you create not only a better business, but also a better life. At the end of each show, you will have three tips or tools that our guests share that you can implement immediately into your life. If you want more information or want to get in contact, you can visit my website, debra.coach. That's D-E-B-R-A dot coach. Please enjoy the show. Today, I am joined by Adam Wolf, who is the co-founder and visionary of Builders of Architecture and also one of my EOS clients and colleagues. So um, welcome to the show, Adam. Awesome to have you here. Thanks, Deborah. Good to be here. Yeah. So you founded or co-founded Builders of Architecture back in 2009. That's 14 years in business, which, you know, in the building industry, the way it is at the moment is certainly no mean feat. Tell me why you started on that pathway and, and how you developed where you are today. Uh, well, when I um, think about uh, my journey, I actually had a vision of always being a, a builder, I think. I was always good with my hands. My sort of school uh, or academic attributes weren't that great. Uh, <laughs> and I always did quite well with my hands. And so I had this vision that I would uh, become a builder. I think when I was a young a young guy, I, I, I would tell my parents I wanted to build roads. Oh, really? But, yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know why. Maybe it was the machinery and that sort of stuff. But uh, Big Tonka trucks. <laughs> yeah, I, can, I can relate to that too. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, and then I found myself a forklift driver working for a uh, car radio company as a young guy. I left school early and, and a bit of a misfit, sort of partied and played up a bit and wasn't, was a bit of a rebel uh, uh, and, and ended up leaving that job after five years and uh, and one of my mates asked, told me to come and work for him at a cabinet making place. And so I was 26 at the time um, and I went there and they were actually struggling quite a lot uh, to find people to support them with the shop fitting joinery that they were doing at the time. And I came in and I sort of, it was pretty easy for me and I did it very you know, quickly and easily. And they were really, really happy with what I was doing, offered me an adult apprenticeship. And so I did that from 26 till, uh, uh, sorry, I'm giving you the wrong ages there. I was 22 when I started. So I was an adult at 22, did that till I was 26. Um, and then instantly when I finished it, I, I, I actually had a friend, uh, a close mate who died in a car accident uh, just around that time. Um, and it was a big deal for our group of mates. Um, it was pretty significant. Uh, and I booked a flight within a couple of weeks of him dying to London. Uh, I was just like, I need to go and live my life. So I quit my job after I got my uh, certificate and I flew to London and um, my now business partner was there already. He had a British passport and I had a few people over there that I knew, including my sister. And so I went to London and uh, was a qualified carpet, uh, cabinet maker over there, lived there, enjoyed the life over there and uh, learned quite a lot in terms of my trade. There was a company that I worked for who was affiliated with a builder as well. So I saw a builder and joinery company working together there. And uh, I, I always had a, in my mind that I would be a builder. I didn't realize that I was manifest, manifesting it at the time and, and sort of goal setting, but uh, came home from London, did a building course with the Master Builders of Victoria, realised how little I knew and what I needed to learn and um, actually got a job with my cousin with a company called Bowden Corp, which was just amazing. James Bowden, shout out to him. He's a great bloke and um, supported me a lot in my journey uh, and enabled me to run projects for him. Uh, high-end architectural homes to get me the experience that I could to 
uh, go for the license that I needed and, and build that uh, portfolio of projects uh, amongst many other things that you need to get it. Uh, and and then Craig and I, because um, Craig was came back to Melbourne um, as well at the same time as me and he did the course with me as well, but we parted ways after we realised we weren't ready to get the registration and he reached out to me about four years in and said, I've built a little maintenance business and um, it's getting to a point where I'm doing things I probably shouldn't. I need a license. Uh, can you, um, yeah, what do you think? Are you And I was really close to applying for my license and so he was turning over 300000 a year with his little maintenance business and that was enough to set us up and that was it. We, we kicked things off and I remember um, signing a contract for a project um, it was a, a big garage for my wife's hairdresser and uh, I still didn't have my registration. <laughs> <laughs> but I got it. And, it was a garage. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We got the registration and the rest is history. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. And so that, so then that sort of started to form. It wasn't always called Builders of Architecture, was it? No, it wasn't. What we, was the business originally? So originally the maintenance business was called Rock City Resolutions and that was Craig's previous business and uh, that was uh, sort of formed around working from Richmond and, and so it was solid constructions in the city. That was kind of the premise of the name. Uh, and resolutions because it was maintenance, I guess. And then we just kept that name because of the maintenance work that we were still doing, but we changed it to Rock City Building Group and, and created it as a company. We th That name never, never really sat well with me. Um, I think potentially Craig as well. But in 2018, I think, we, uh, we rebranded to Builders of Architecture. Mm. And that is because obviously the business is very much about building architecturally designed homes. Is that right? Yeah, definitely. I think we, we, we talked about calling a bull and a wolf and we had all these different names that we came up with, but always our catch cry was building our builders of architecture. That was the, the sort of slogan under the names that we came up with. I remember yeah. Craig and I discussing it. We were like talking about, um, calling our team pups, you know, like and because of wolf, bullen or bullen wolf. Anyway, so builders of architecture, uh, and then we, I was doing. We were doing quite a lot of work in marketing and qualification, and we we were to be honest, we were getting a lot of people call up saying, um, "Can you just come around and put a little box on the back of my house, or can you?" put up a pergola for me or you can you do these maintenance little jobs and we wanted to get people to qualify themselves out from us um, and we felt like our name was a good way to do that because yeah. it speaks to what we do yeah so sort of good size projects of yeah. architectural value perfect okay and so now these days how, how many staff do you have what kind of work do you do yeah, so we build high-end homes in Melbourne. Um, okay. They range from a million dollars to five million dollars. Um, we do do some smaller jobs. We have some relationships with some architects that, uh, you know, we've built such a great relationship that we work directly with the architect and, and the client from an early stage. Uh, we've got 11 team in Melbourne. We actually made some pretty significant changes through the COVID period in the business. We used to run a lot of carpenters and labourers and apprentices and found through COVID that we weren't able to keep up with the requirements put on us. So we had to outsource a lot of that stuff. And it was actually a real revelation for the business that changed how we operate and made us leaner, but enabled us to reward our team that were performing to a really high level and give them more responsibility. And so in addition to those team members, we also have some team working in the Philippines and, and our finance manager, Diego, actually works from Vietnam, mm. uh, which is cool. 
Yeah. So I, I think you're right because you, you literally kind of change the way that you do business. And, and in fact, the way that you approach building is quite different too, isn't it? So you like to get involved early on with the architect and the owner um, and really get involved, which means you can then be more confident around pricing, timeframes, et cetera, et cetera. Tell me a bit more about that process. I think the, the, the root of that stems from the stories that I hear about the negativity in the industry. And I think every time that I've explored those challenges people face, you can drill it back to a decision that the client's made somewhere along the line. And ma majority of the time, the client hasn't been given all of the information that they need to make an informed decision. And, uh, and it's unfair for the client to be in that predicament and then realize that if they had have had some more awareness to the budget from someone that was going to build it, they may have taken a different path. There's a lot of things in this industry and I don't think people really understand the process to build a home. There's a lot of red tape to cut through. There's a lot of people that are involved to get a project to start on site. And uh, by working with a team of professionals, you just get all of the information you need to make informed decisions at the right time. And so mm -hmm. I think the builder needs to be treated as a consultant in the process, particularly for larger homes. I think that they provide a clarity uh, and support an architect in conversations the architect might not be completely across, in to, in, you know, specifically around budget. We uh, have obviously a lot to do with the pricing of projects when we price them. And so an architect's job's to design the home. They may have some idea of cost because they're seeing cost, but particularly in the environment we're in at the moment, it's very difficult to know what things are gonna cost. Mm -hmm. And uh, the client needs to be informed through every step of the way that they can afford it. Because I think statistics would say between 50 and 70% of, um, projects don't go ahead um wow. yeah quite I mean, much. It, yeah it's quite significant that projects just get dropped because uh there's just lack of awareness to cost i mean there's obviously other reasons that they stop too but uh, it 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 does lean itself to the decision making steps and the communication provided and i feel like if you pick the right builder, obviously you need to pick the right team. It's like anything. You need to pick the right people in your environment to support you through the process, but the outcomes are far better. Yeah. And that's the proven process that we kind of talk about in the US is you've got the proven process, you know how to do it, and mm. that, that gives clients some confidence that they're actually going to get the results that they require. So... Um, I introduced you as being one of my EOS clients, and I know that we kind of we met through EO, so the Entrepreneurs Organisation, mm. and you had been self-implementing EOS for a while, and now we're working together. Tell me, how did you come across EOS, and what was it that made you want to think about it for your business? Well, uh, I guess uh, if I start from the beginning, early days of our business, I was I. I use this term quite a lot, I swipe and deploy, and I'd swiped and deployed a lot of paperwork and document from my previous employer. I had a box, like an archive box full of folders and bits of paper and different things that I had acquired and uh, was implementing into my business. Uh, and I'd got to a point where I was feeling like, I don't know what to do next. I, I yeah, I was, I was stuck and I remember getting a phone call from uh, a lady named Julie. Uh, shout out to Julie and Mick from Builders Business Black Belt. But they, uh, Julie, obviously we chatted three or four times on the phone, but they were a business coach and I was like, this is, this is just what I need, you know. And so that was um, maybe 2014 and so ended up joining their organization and, and was with them and, and I just invested myself in it completely, learned what they talk about as the personal success ritual and, and all these different tools to help you grow and develop. And it was probably my first real exposure to high level personal development. I, I really didn't, um, I didn't have a lot of that awareness in my life up until then. So it was quite late and, uh, 
moving, you know, that, that then sort of changed the way I was viewing the world. So I was looking at different things in the social media channels. And anyway, I came across this, uh, what was called an unconvention, Jack Delosa from the Entourage. And, um, and it was a free event in Melbourne. So I just went to it. I um, was just blown away by this event. It was, now, now I realize clearly it was a hundred percent a marketing event and, um, <laughs> but I wasn't that in tune then. And I ended up moving on from Mick and, and business builders, which was called uncover human profits back then. But, um, we moved to entourage. I did the entourage. I was there for four years and spent some time with Jack Delosa actually on a meditation retreat with Tom Cronin and, uh, he mentioned to me to read the book rocket fuel and I was like, yeah. cool. So, and I was obviously reading a lot and learned how important reading was. And I was like, to develop these habits around reading. And so I read rocket fuel and that was the foundations for me to understand the AOS process. And then, uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure what year that would have been. It might've been 17 or 18 and, uh, and so from then on, from there on, I was reading all the, all the, the books, uh, and I introduced level 10 meetings. We had them on paper. I was doing them for four hours at one point. And, uh, <laughs> it was, yeah, it was really crazy. And then get a grip just changed it all for me. I read get, get a grip. And I mean, my copy of get a grip is full of highlighters and, dog's ears and, you know, underlines and underscores. And I used that whole book to self-implement uh, EOS into the business. And we definitely had some financial pressure prior to COVID. It was something that, you know, we needed to fix in the business. And so that was one of the real reasons I self-implemented because we needed to fix things and get it to a place that we could then uh, sort of move from that point. Um and yeah, I, if I had my time again, I, I wouldn't have self-implemented. Oh, no, I think you did a good job. And let's face it, I mean, you had your best year ever um, the year before I came on board. So obviously you did some things that, that made a big difference to the business. True. But it sounds like you have know, four-hour level 10 meetings, probably doing your own version of EOS as opposed to pure EOS. <laughs> well, actually, I joined EO and I remember putting, and so I joined EO sort of mid-COVID because I, couldn't go to the entourage anymore and because it was in Sydney and that was a big thing for me being able to travel there for a couple of days every six weeks and get away from the office and do one of their seminars court, 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 uh, you know trainings that they put on and yeah. uh, and and I'd been re re recommended to EO by someone who I knew from the entourage that was no longer there so I joined EO which was amazing because it was in Melbourne and I was put in a forum and I remember I was in there three or four months and I was doing something with EOS and I posted in a chat, which took me three days to write this post because I was just thinking, no one's going to know this. I put it in, I said something about templates for EOS and Jenny, who is your friend, was in my forum. She said, I'm an EOS implementer and I went, what? <laughs> And so um, I was like, I am in such the right space. And then so I talked with Jenny. I went through all this stuff. She then said to me, have you got software? And I said, no. <laughs> and so then we got the software and, like, it was just a game changer, the software. That then enhanced our meetings. It gave us a placeholder for our VTO. It was really the catalyst for me to be able to really implement and do it well because then we could just – put all that information in somewhere. And because we were now in a COVID world, all the team were meeting online anyway, so it just worked really well. But at my journey is all the people and networks and coaches and groups and, and that sort of thing that's really supported me to, to get to here for sure. And I think, I mean, I always say that I think everybody needs like a personal coach or mentor. You need an operating system for your business. Personally, I prefer EOS. Um, and then you need to have a peer group as well. And I think your EO mm. gives you that peer group. And I know it's an, it's an amazing organisation for having those peer discussions, for that training, for that learning. Um, and then, of course, EOS helps you to run that business. Um, so 
tell me what I mean Rocket Fuel I didn't realize that was the first book you read I mean that that was a game changer for me because I think that I've run businesses most of my life either for people or for myself and um, I've always tried to play both the visionary and the integrated role I didn't realize there were you know they're two quite different skill sets and of course Rocket Fuel talks about that they go hey look the visionary is very much this kind of person the integrator is this kind of person and actually it's best that you don't try and do both because um, you don't get the best results so tell me how how business has changed since you started implementing EO even from self-implementation? Oh, uh, where do I start? Uh, I mean, this, having a structure to follow, I guess really what I would say on in, in response to that is the simplicity. So all of the things that are in EOS are what you can find in majority of business books. Building a business and a structure around a business is similar across it. You know, you need accountability chart, right seats, right roles, you know, other terms, right people in the right seats on the bus, all that sort of stuff's really real. But the simplicity is uh, what's really key. I mean, I think initially my business map or what we, what we would have called it previously probably had eight leadership seats on it and I was doing them all uh, and now we've got three and that's all we need. <laughs> uh, and so and simple is, is easier. Things like being able to do the people analyzer, gets it wants a capacity to do it. I mean, that was just the biggest breath of fresh air for me. Our team just use it left, right and center. They, you know, if there's something going on, do they get it? Do they want it? Do they have the capacity to do it? Um, the Elevate and Delegate tool, just to work out what you need to offload, how you can bring yourself up, what processes you need to build. Uh, the simplicity is is the key. And um, we just didn't have that before. I think what happens with most entrepreneurs building a business is they make it too complex. And I did that, 100% did that, made it so complex mm -hmm. that it was too hard to operate. I think it's true. And I think um, depending on where you've worked beforehand, I remember that when I was in corporate world, you know, we'd have um, people, their version of a people analyzer, which was performance development review process. It was 14 pages. You know, <laughs> it would take people three or four hours to fill mm. it out and then a couple of hours to go through it. And it's like, that's what we get taught is you have to have this level of complexity. Whereas in actual fact, as you know, the people analyzer, it's a tool that doesn't even need a piece of paper. And if you really want to do it formally once a year, it's a one page piece of paper. Mm. And yet you can get everything out of that yeah i think the key though the one thing that i learned around that was that you can't have that without having an accountability chart with the key mm -hmm. core competencies because you need to be able to build that out and know what it is that that person needs to do for that seat for them to be able to assess them on the gwc and so you know, I would read a lot of these things and try and do them, but I didn't have the other things. And so you, you and, and I think that when I self-implemented, there was a little bit of a lack of clarity around that sort of side of it, which, you know, we've just enhanced, enhanced as we've gone and obviously with your support, taking it to another level. And I think it's you're right. I mean, you actually, you're quite fortunate. You read Get a Grip, which does take you through the kind of the process that an EOS implementer goes through. Yeah, whereas tra Traction is the how-to book. And what I find with a lot of clients that have been self-implementing is they've actually focused on the VTO because that's the easy part, right? The two-page plan, we've got all that. And the, and it's actually done by the visionary who just writes it all down and goes, right, I've got a plan, tick, uh, moving on. And really, that's the least important thing. As you said, the most important thing is that accountability chart. Who, What are the roles, the functions that the business actually actually cannot live without what do we want to hold these people accountable or responsible for um, and then it starts to develop into all the other things like how do we measure them what are the scorecards what's the, the measurables for that person um, and you can do the whole people analyzer so yep they share our values but they actually do double the role mm. so i think that yeah reading the, the get a grip gives you a little bit more insight into that but it's still it's it's hard to do it when you're working in the business yourself don't you think because 
I tried implementing EOS myself into my own business. And to be perfectly honest, even though I am completely trained and had done this, what, 30, 40 times with people, I completely fucked it up. <laughs> and so I had to get a buddy in from EOS to actually help me with it. And, and that's just been a game changer as well in terms of having an external person come in and they can see what you cannot see. No, I mean, it, I'm, I'm glad you asked this question, Deborah, because I think the number one thing that I would say is that now I'm a participant and not a facilitator. And um, I, I want the accountability that you give me. I need it. I need to see things that I couldn't see and I need to get better. I mean, I'm absolutely super driven by my own personal growth and awareness. And I want to um, be able to go into those sessions uh, with an ability to contribute and learn and hear and give my team the freedom to uh, challenge me and, and provide their thoughts and, and not try to facilitate it and fumble around and be, oh, I don't know whether we should do this or, you know, like, cause it, clearly like it's not, I'm not trained in it. So I, um, I've, I've felt, a, a ton of weight off my shoulders. I mean, the preparation I would have done for the quarterlies and things like that is pretty intense, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, I feel like just having that pressure off. And uh, I, one of the things I would say is that uh, doing them with you is I had this tendency to want this so perfect. I wanted it so perfect. And my there's times where we've had sessions and it's just let it go, keep talking, get it out, work through it. And I probably would have shut things like that down and so oh, we need to move on. We've got so just feeling feeling the room, making sure that the environment's getting the right outcomes and being a participant's huge. It's such a difference. It's yeah, it's been great. Been great to build out the VTO from everyone's opinion, not just mine and me facilitating. So then everyone's a little bit guarded and doesn't really want to say stuff because yeah. we've made significant changes to it, you know, and uh, prior to that, it would have just been all me. And I think people would have sort of had opinions, but not necessarily said them. Yeah. And it's funny, isn't it? Because I've done through this self-implementing process with a with a number of clients now. I'm probably about to know client number five that of self-implementers, and they've all got a VTO and they've all got a version of an accountability chart. And I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but I do like to challenge it. And I do think there is merit when you bring your team on the journey and they have input. You don't end up being a million miles away from what you thought it would be. You end up being pretty much on the same track as you thought. But the beauty of it is everybody's had their input. Everybody feels like they were heard, and so the the level of buy-in is just massive, right? Because suddenly it's like, oh, we got to put that together with as a team. Um, so even if you've done it, it's like even just reviewing it can be really beneficial, I think, um, with the team to make sure that they really are on the same page. I know we've we've tweaked little things on the VTO, we've tweaked little things on the values just to make them really meaningful for the team. Yeah, I, I mean, the reason that we develop the relationship you have today was because you were comfortable to to work with what i'd already built and i was really anxious about someone coming in and changing it all um and it sort of made me resist a bit uh getting 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 to where we are today but that that was really refreshing for me it really uh i think we changed we changed quite a bit but like it was still like I respect what you've done and that was important. It was really important to me because I put a lot of work into it. Uh, and so, I mean, but just something simple, like we have 10, maybe between six and seven, six to eight words in our values for each one. And we've just changed them all to two words so we can remember them. Yeah. And like, cause we couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> And so uh, just simple things like that, which have been fantastic. Oh, cool. Hey, I'll tell you, do you have a favourite EOS tool? I'd ha probably have to be GWC. Yeah, yeah. I just, <laughs> it has just 
been so significant for my ability to my gut would always know but i would be caught up in oh, i can't i can't deal with this right now mm. but as soon as you ask those simple questions you just know yeah. um, next would be elevate and delegate just to be able to put activities into buckets and help people grow and learn and find out what they do and don't want to do and uh, you know it goes side by side with gets it once the capacity to do it because that you might have someone in a seat that is not necessarily right for it but they might be right for another one and you can support that transition if need be mm -hmm. uh, but we recently had a team member who's moved from a site manager to a project manager and I mean the conversations around him moving to a project manager was actually he would be a better project manager based on his uh, attributes like we could see it and it was just clear because we had the things the, the, the components def defined but I mean there's there's lots like there's lots that I would um, the level 10 meeting has been amazing for our business. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a big believer in the uh, term celebra celebrate problems as opportunities to fix. Yep. And I've always been very, very uh, stern, I guess, with the team that, that, a, that a problem is an opportunity to fix and we've built our business and systems around putting things that we learn into a place that fixes it forever. Uh, and that was before we even knew about EOS and the level 10 meetings and to have a structure where team can place issues that they can then select in a meeting that then they can then fix the power that gives them an investment into the business is enormous because they don't have the ability to just complain. They have the opportunity to fix it. And uh, it. Yeah. everything is micro moments that turn into large outcomes. And I'm a big believer in that. It's, it's throughout, throughout the world, little things make big things. <laughs> Well, that's cool. Um, I want to talk a bit about the scorecard as well, because I know that, you know, the scorecard, people think that it's like a dashboard. You decide what you're going to measure and then you just put it up there and it's there forever. Um, yet we have, I have a slightly different view of that scorecard, I believe, that it actually takes a long time to get to a really good scorecard. And it should change depending on what the focus for the next 90 days of the business is as well. So tell us a little bit about your scorecard and how that's developed over time and what, what it does for you. I'd say it's still developing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say that too, Bali. Uh, <laughs> it's hard. It's definitely hard. I, mean, I think we're still tracking a lot of lag measures rather than lead measures, and uh, we try and we try and look for ways to improve that regularly. We've actually made some iterations to it just recently. Uh, I guess. We've gone from 25 scorecards, we went to about eight and we're now back to about 13, uh, which I think is probably the right number. And I think uh, one of the things that I've really found and probably something I avoided a little bit early on was to use money as a tool. Uh, but it, it's, uh, it's something everyone believes deeply is real, which it obviously has power and uh, everyone wants it. So it's a good decision-making component. And so we use uh, the dollars, potentially loss of income for projects that are going over time, uh, which is a, is a lead measure because the projects haven't finished. And so we can, we've got day rates that, we need to earn per day so we can track that. Mm -hmm. Obviously set revenue targets uh, and, and it, it's a bit of a um, 
controversial metric revenue, I think. I think it's a lag measure, but we also have forecasted revenue in there. So it, if we lose a job that we're pricing, it shows up very quickly. Yep. Uh, and so uh, if I were, to answer your question, like, more, I think what the scorecards do for us is they drive direction. And even though they need evolving, they are always being tracked and checked. An example, our operations and manager. And weekly, I think, is one of the, the oh, key weekly things, is right? essential, yeah. 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 So, uh, and, and I think, so I'll give you an example. So we... OH&S is quite important in the construction industry, as everyone would know, so occupational health and safety. But it is very challenging because there's obviously we're talking about generating revenue, we're talking about, like, keeping jobs on track, where, you know, there's challenges all the time with things not quite right, whatever, like anything, I guess. But it can play a bit of a second sort of agenda and so keeping guys motivated on it you might have a burst for one month and then it drops off and um, so and I I went to one of our sites who's it's a very unique site and uh, it basically it's three meters off the ground and so uh, it's quite unique and it's not something we've done before it's in a flood zone so there's all these requirements to elevate the property and wow. Um, the team had pulled down the scaffold and uh, were getting up there with an extension ladder. There was doors on a corner, wide open. There's a three and a half metre drop. And I was just like, what's going on? Like, where's the OH&S here? And, I mean, they're not complacent, but there just wasn't checks in place. And so instantly we put, I put in a level 10 meeting. We had a discussion about it. We've created a checklist that now they do weekly. And what happens is that that checklist is reported on in a weekly scorecard in the operations that that checklist has been filled out and it's online. It's 15 dot points and it's making sure that the team are just walking around the site and doing an oh and inspection and the number one thing that will make that happen every week is that that scorecard's filled in. Yeah. And so it just adds to that accountability piece. So you might build systems in your business, but if you don't have something that they report on, mm. it'll drop off. Yep. I love it. And that's really cool because that brings the process to life and it means mm. there's no there's no opportunity for it to be kind of swept under the carpet or forgotten about. It's part yes. of the measurables, yeah. Mm. And, and I think you're right. I mean, I think, you know, somewhere between five and 15 numbers is absolutely spot on. So for some businesses, it's less. For others, it's more. It just depends on what you're trying to do. And I think it depends on where the business is at too, what's going on in the business and what do we need. It's, de it's designed, as you said, to drive um, behavioural change, set direction, keep us on track. So whatever the business requires in that 90 days is what you should be measuring. Yeah, I've, I've, I've introduced a lot of processes and systems into the business. We use Trello to track our projects. We've built eight, built, turned, the, turned the projects into eight different stages and we have like Trello boards that we create every job. And uh, we've had team members that we want running these boards. We've got guys that have helped develop the boards that are very motivated to use it, but then new team come in and they've got their own way of building and they use these lists in the after rather than in the beginning and they're designed to prompt your thinking not to go oh yeah i did that but i kind of did it uh, and so having an ability to force them to do an action yep. so they report on those boards now which then feed into a scorecard which then we can then translate into a, a scorecard that we put in uh we, we use 90, um, that extra action, it develops the habit. And what you need is to change habits. It's that, it's that simple. Like people are set in their ways. They've done things a particular way. And so as a business owner, I've got to change their habits. Mm. And so that like adding something, I mean, we, had, we, we created quarterly revenue targets for the projects and, uh, last quarter, they smashed them out of the park. Yeah. And before we hadn't, we didn't have that. And because they were tracking that, 
like they push so hard in that last month to hit them. Yep. But it, in times gone by, they, they would have just drifted out. And it's interesting, you talked about finances, and obviously you've got a lot of financial measures in the scorecard, which is which is great, helps keep it on track. I know a lot of people listening in might be thinking, oh, you know, but if we share finances with a the team, they'll know what we're what we're making or, you know, what they had the business is doing. How would you respond to that? Because I get that question a lot from people. It's like, I don't want to share the finances with the team. Yeah. Well, I think it's a cultural thing. Like I've never been uh I I I want I I don't want to be the bottleneck of this company. I want to free my time up, and my goal is for it to run on its own, so I can do other things to grow it uh, in different ways. And uh, our team run their budgets; they know all of the uh, project margins. They produce all of the invoices they do all of the variations or anything to do with the money and the project mm -hmm. uh, I think transparency is really important I feel like uh, our bonus structures that we provide to our team so our team have uh, bonus structures based on performance we call it make it happen dollars so their KPIs uh, are, are set depending on different roles and there's a, a certain level of income they can earn in addition to their wage uh, and then there's revenue rewards so if they generate certain levels of income for the business they get additional amounts and so if if they're seeing profit and they're hitting their targets they know they're going to get extra money and so uh, I think my team and our culture they want me, they want us, they want the business to succeed. They're motivated by that. Uh, and so I don't think people can perform unless they have, unless you give them your trust and that they trust you and that if you're hiding things from your team, then culture will suffer. Okay. I do also agree, though, that there is a, time where that might not be right like my forum um, my eo forum you know quite big businesses in there that have had times where they've had people seeing things that are incredibly um, exciting for a business owner and so there are times where you might need to um, put more emphasis on percentage rather than dollar and I think generally on the VTO, you know, we have an overall income and an easier percentage amount of GP or net profit, whatever people decide to actually put on there. But um, I think it gives an opportunity for you to actually educate the team as well. I mean, your team are very involved in the finances, but for a lot of businesses, a lot of people don't have any clue about that. And, and it's a great chance for them to actually see not only how the business becomes profitable, therefore we all benefit, but also where they can add value or ensure that that is actually being achieved which I think mm. is important. Mm. Okay, I've got a couple more questions for you. They keep coming through. So um, the visionary integrator relationship. So I'm very happy that we've now got you as sort of a, a full-time full integrator um, starting this week. But before that, I kind of stepped into a bit of fractional integrator work just to give you a bit of a sense of what an integrator can add to the business. Um, what you've, you've already read Rocket Fuel years and years and years ago, but now putting it into actual practice, what's the benefit, do you think, of having an integrator and having VI meetings, et cetera, in the business? Oh, not doing it alone. <laughs> uh, I, I remember reading Rocket Fuel and doing the I, – I, I don't know how long after, but I, I obviously – was pretty interested in the uh, content that was available online. So I did the assessment and uh, I remember being like equal visionary integrator with my responses and I was like, oh, right. You know? And then I was like, is that even right? And it turns out it's rare. But, it's um, rare. Yeah, 5%, I think they say, is uh, people are like that. I'm one of those two. <laughs> yeah, and 
Um, I was like, well, it makes sense. It makes a lot of sense because I am envis envisaging everything and, and turning it into reality. I'm bringing these things to life. Now I have support around me. Um, so that's been, uh, you know, really, really great, but like, it's only quite recent. Obviously you, you've been helping me, Deborah, and I would say that, uh, the reason that we've got Tom joining us as an integrator now um, is because you were in that fractional seat and you said to me, uh, he's your next integrator. And I said, let's make it happen in three months. And you said, why not tomorrow? <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> why not? Yep. And so, I mean, that's an example of the, the difference because that has just been a seat that I have thought was impossible, not impossible to fill, but uh, going to be quite challenging. And to have done it now and to have that support, I guess, or uh, that clarity, the clarity of roles will no doubt drive this business forward and free me up to do bigger and better things. Exactly, the big picture stuff as well. Yeah, yeah the whole delegate and elevate that you talked about before, I mean, that, that whole point of that tool is to get people doing the things where they really add the most value to the business. And so if you're doing what you love uh, and what you're really good at, then you're going to add huge amounts more value and visionaries generally add more value when they're freed up to the big picture stuff. I also think that when you make decisions like this and change, that the pressure that that generates forces the business to grow. And uh, we were, you know, we're seeing that across different departments where things have just got a little bit cruisy mm -hmm. or people are doing things for other people that they really shouldn't be because they're not creating a process or a system to elevate and delegate that person. And by making change, you know, not, not every day, but, you know, as you, as you grow the business, you should be making changes to force people to get better. And also as, as the business grows, you know, the, the roles that you need are different as well. And so like understanding your yes. your team, understanding what they are really good at and where they want to go in the business is invaluable because then you can actually help them develop into it. Or for some people, it's, they're actually quite comfortable doing that role and not wanting to go any further. But knowing that means you can make better decisions about how you use them. Mm, for sure. Mm. Hey, I'm conscious of time. I've got, I've got one last question I'm going to ask you for three top tips and tools. So my last question really is around... What would you say to anyone who is self-implementing EOS right now? Um, what would be your advice to them? Get an implementer. Get an, in, get an implementer. <laughs> oh, look, I would. I honestly, I, uh, I'm not, I'm not dwelling on the past, but I feel like there was a number of conversations in the business for a couple of years around getting an implementer in to implement the system. And I think we got caught up on cost too much. And I guess I didn't have an integrator at the time to really sort of, I mean, even, even our team like felt like I was doing a great job and didn't think we needed it. So uh, it really dri it was really me driving it because I wanted I wanted the space and I needed the freedom to participate. And uh, I would 100% say it's up there with one of the better decisions that we've made in the business. That's awesome. Thank you. And I think you're right. There is definitely a cost involved, but hopefully the people will see that there's value. The value is of... next level. Yeah, cool. Okay. Three top tips or tools. I mean, we've talked about heaps already, but if you just had to leave you know, the listeners with three things they should do when they leave this podcast, what would they be? Uh, well, I, I, when I got my first coach, he taught me the importance of reading and, mm. uh, he said that there is, it, it's, it's your cheap path, you know, like there's people that have done it before. And if you don't, uh, 
invest your time in learning from others. You can't get a kickstart. And so having Mick open my eyes up to the world of personal development and growth was a game changer for not only my business, but my personal life. Mm-hmm. It's helped me everywhere. Uh, I actually just went to a Tony Robbins event, which was just incredible. I signed I mean up to for ask all you about stuff. that, but I'll ask that offline. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm, I've got another coach with them and uh, I really feel like I'll never not have a mentor and, a, and, and that sort of environment in my world and, and, and reading would be a huge tip, you know, like, and, and not reading anything, reading what you need. And, and a tip inside that would be that I learned from Jim Quick, who's a memory expert, that if you're reading a book, ask three questions to yourself that you want to learn from that book before you read it so that they're very prominent when you read it. And that I tend to pick up books that I need to learn that thing. Like I need to understand what it is that's in that book so that I can get that um, that knowledge to then implement into my business or my implementer can, and my integrator can implement into into my business. Yeah. Um, yeah. I like that. So, so ask through, so get yourself three questions, the answers that you need to get from that book. So when you're reading the book, you're actually taking it on board and you're coming yeah. up with the answer to that. Get mm. a coach or a mentor. As I said, that's always my thing. I think everybody needs a personal coach or a mentor. It just um, personal development is, is huge. Third thing. Uh, well, I think uh, business and, and what you do are quite separate. And I think a lot of people get into business from a technician mindset because they're good at something, but they're two different things. So building a business and being good at, like for us, building houses, is they're quite different. And so having a process to operate your business under is essential uh, to be uh, able to follow some sort of model that enables you to see the path forward. Business can be very overwhelming, uh, but if you've got clarity and, and can see how you navigate things so you can break through glass ceilings, it's very, very liberating. <laughs> I love it. I could not have prompted you any better. Thank you, Adam. You've been awesome. But, but I hear you. I mean, all those things that I think are really important. Um, and I, I, yeah, I definitely, I definitely, uh, while there is some prompting, they, these are really important to me. I mean, having, being able to follow a structure. I actually am a coach for uh, small business owners in the accelerator group in EO, so businesses from $250,000 um, and, and pushing them to a million so they can be good EO members. And I've done that for three years and uh, I, I have different themes for my, my uh, the, the people I coach. And this year it's structural success because I have – Talk to them about profit first. I've talked to them about the one thing, uh, the book, the one thing, and, and determining what it is that you need to work on, what's most important. But ultimately, if you don't develop a structure for your business to operate under, you will not, it's not going to work. You need the clarity to be able to develop the business so that you can foresee what you need to do in the future. Even if you're filling every seat in the business, you need to be able to know what it is that you need to do in the future so that you can move that direction. Otherwise, it could be a real whirlwind. And particularly for us, we see a lot of trades businesses. They're great plumbers. They're great electricians. They do amazing work. And then they end up with 12 staff and that just falls apart because they have no model, no structure, and then they're back to doing the work themselves with three guys and it's just this vicious circle and you see it all the time. 
So, I mean, that's a very lovely lead into if you want any traction or get a grip book, let me know for your, for your people that you're coaching. But same to the listeners, like honestly, um, traction is the how-to book. Get a grip tells you the way that you should do it. Um, I can't, you know, even if you want to self-implement, I'm fully supportive of that. You've got to do something. Otherwise, the business falls apart. And that comes from somebody who's owned businesses that have done really, really well and also had a couple of pretty massive failures as well. And that generally came down to um, lack of structure, lack of measurables, not really knowing how we're operating it, not getting the processes right. So, yeah, EOS is definitely a game changer. Hey, Adam, um, tell me a little bit about what is your ideal client for Builders of Architecture? Who do you love working? Because you've got the architect side, you've got the, the client side as well. Tell us a little bit about who you enjoy working with and why. Well, from a personality perspective, a, de a de decision maker, you know, someone that's, you know, really um, committed to the direction that they're heading. Uh, our clients, we call them forever homes that we build. We don't work with people that are uh, looking to make a quick buck because we don't build homes that can be built to that level of quality. They're homes that last forever. Uh, and, so, you know, they're professionals. Uh, we do a lot of work for doctors and, and that sort of has just been a natural prog progression. We've worked with a few that refer us to others and that sort of thing. Uh, we work with clients that are motivated by building a team around them and they want uh, a builder and a client and an architect to work together to get to a good outcome. Um, our demographic is a little bit, we, we were doing a lot of homes for people that were expanding their family uh, and loved the area that they lived in, loved the schools for their kids, had been in the house for a, a little while and needed to grow it to suit their new lifestyle. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was predominantly 35 to 40, majority of the time it was a, a, a the, the wife that was driving the the decision to build because they needed more space. Uh, so, yeah. So somebody who, who really wants partners in the process who are going to make sure you get the best possible result. And that forever home, it's actually part of the proven process, right? Your proven process is that even once you've built it, you're regularly revisiting to make sure everything is still absolutely as it should be and, and keeping everything on track, right? Yes. Yeah, so... Uh, I've actually tweaked it a little bit after I came to um, Strong in Six with you, Deborah, because um, oh, yeah. I heard someone there say that their guarantee, this this um, company, it was an architectural firm, and their guarantee was that they would be friends at the end of the project, which I just loved. I just thought that was amazing. So uh, ours is uh, we'll be friends at the end of the project, and that we will do an annual inspection every year as long as you live there. Mm, that is uh, awesome. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, cool. Okay, Adam, that's brilliant. Hey, thank you so much for your time. If people want to get in contact with you, what's the best way to get in contact with you? Uh, they can uh, join, jump on my LinkedIn page uh, or uh, they could give me a call. <laughs> yeah, okay. What's your number? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean... Is it appropriate to share my number here? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I can... I'll people uh, from the US give out their numbers. It's a, and people who are really high profile kind of go, yeah, give me a call. Bob Berg, I don't know if you know who Bob Berg is, but he wrote the Go-Giver series. Amazing man. He came on the podcast and, and also his um, writing partner as well, David. And they literally said, here's our contact details. If anybody wants to get in contact with us, you can just call us. It's like, okay. <laughs> yeah, well, it's Adam at buildersofarchitecture.com.au and my mobile is 0423 Please reach Great. out. Happy to have a chat. I'll, you know, I'm very motivated by people having a good experience building their homes. So regardless of the situation you're in or, or you've just got a couple of questions, I'm more than happy to support the journey because it can be an overwhelming one. Yeah, completely understand. Hey, look, Adam, I um, <laughs> look forward to seeing you in our Level 10 meeting later on today, but it's been great to talk to you on here. Thanks, um, thanks for your time. Thanks for thanks sharing. I uh, really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the podcast show, Better Business, Better Life. My name is Deborah Chantry-Taylor. I'm an EOS implementer, family business advisor, business and leadership coach, podcaster, and speaker. However, I'm also a business owner with several current business interests.
I'm fortunate to have lived the high life with all the lifestyle, the toys, you name it, and then I've lost it all, not only once but twice in two spectacular train wrecks. I know what it's like to experience the highs and lows. I came across EOS when they launched into New Zealand using my entrepreneur's playground and event centre in Parnell, Auckland. I love the simplicity of the tools and their philosophies fitted my personal brand statement perfectly. The brilliance is in the simplicity. I've always been passionate about seeing entrepreneurs lead a life they love, and now I help them live that EOS life. Doing what they love, with people they love, making a huge difference in the world, being compensated appropriately, and with time to pursue other passions. If you want more information or want to get in contact about using EOS in your business, you can visit my website at debra.coach. That's www.debra.coach. Thanks for listening.